we're back. This is Boomer Life on Sea Isle 650. Here I am stuck in the middle with you. Yes, I'm stuck in the middle with you. And I'm wondering what it is I This is Boomer Life on Sea Isle 650. I'm Joanne Sutton. In the studio with me today is Jim Doyle, Senior Financial Consultant with Investors Group. So on Boomer Life, this hour, we're talking about your financial future. A well-thought-out plan for your financial future is an integral part of building the life that you want for both yourself and for your family. So Jim, before the break, we touched on the concept of loss aversion. And I'm not sure whether our listeners would be familiar with this term or this concept, so maybe you could elaborate a little bit for us. Yeah, it's, it's one of those unconscious things that we do, but it's very powerful. So let me explain a little bit about what loss aversion is or this fear of losing. The fear of losing uh, causes us to make investment decisions uh, that show up in a number of interesting ways. For example, uh, a loss aversion uh, could lead us to excessively focus on the short-term volatility uh, of, a mar- of an investment instead of looking at the expected long-term uh, performance expectations. Instead of viewing the portfolio as a whole, each investment has a role to play. Uh, loss aversion could encourage us to look at the individual investment, losing sight of the big picture. So it could actually make us or help us or steer us to make the wrong decision. I guess this is why we should care about this? Well, well it's very significant. If you consider that working with an advisor can add as much as 3% to your average long-term annual return on your investments, according to a recent uh, study by the Financial Planning Standards Council, if you're going to vary ad hoc from your financial plan, this could diminish your long-term returns, which is why it's important to look at the things that steer our financial choices. People tend to keep money in safe, interest-bearing investments, attempting to protect what they have, fearful of any loss. But what investors don't realize is that the low return in safe options will not be able to keep pace with inflation, threatening to reduce their standard of living over time. It seems investors are much more fearful of of suffering a loss today rather than addressing the real threat of living with a reduced standard of living well into the future. This is also the reason people fail to acknowledge a loss in the markets and continue to hold on to investments which are losing money for much longer than they rationally should. Now, one way of not falling into the loss aversion trap is to keep the big picture in mind or have a long-term view of your investments. For a properly balanced and diversified portfolio, not all of your investments are going to be performing at the time at the same time. Remember, this is by design. Jim, I think it's pretty clear that investors want the best for themselves, but are torn between the decisions that they need to make. How can you help them help themselves? You know, as advisors, we're constantly dealing with a a baffling set of paradoxes from clients. They want safety and growth, but constantly try to beat the market and are quick to look for answers when portfolios underperform. They call themselves buy and hold investors, but rely on their advisors. Uh, when volatility spikes and then they want in or, or they want out. And when spouses or partners have competing objectives and perspectives, it pulls them in different directions. This is where advisors can help clients make better decisions. So we're talking about couples now in an effort to make better decisions. Is this why it's essential that both partners be engaged, financially speaking, with their planner? Uh, absolutely. Implementing the plan is the big part. If couples can get past their money taboos and develop their goals and perspectives together, they're more likely to achieve financial success. You know, we've mentioned this before, but being reluctant to talk about these issues can actually be a huge problem. Do you think it's possible that having these conversations uh, can be a little bit like opening a Pandora's box? You know, for a lot of couples, a lot of families, it's not uncommon that there's money secrets, differing risk profiles, and competing agendas to take into consideration. We all bring our our personal investment experience to the table when it comes to finances, but understanding how these experiences affect our decisions can be really helpful. So let me give you an example. What happens when you feel that you're not being heard or your input isn't being taken into consideration? What happens? Well, you usually have a pretty good argument. Uh, so what do you recommend when a partner tells you that they can't get their spouse engaged in that planning process, that one partner basically doesn't want to play? I'm sure you've come across this before. Yeah, we, we do. Okay. 
I think the best advice that I can offer here is that instead of waiting for your spouse to see the light, so to speak, I think it's necessary to get into the planning, even if the other partner is not willing to engage. And here's a couple of thoughts for consideration. Work with a financial planner who can help explain your options and help keep you on track. It's your advisor's job to keep you from making the big mistakes that you can't recover from. The next thing I think you want to do is, is gather your records, your bank statements, your credit card details, investment statements, your tax records, your bills, your insurance papers and so forth, and know exactly what your current situation looks like. And I think it's really huge. Uh, you know, don't feel embarrassed about this. Um, learning about your investments, uh, uh, gaining confidence in, in your financial situation, it takes time and it takes some effort. It sounds like there is a number of moving parts when it comes to creating a financial plan. You've basically got your plan, then you've got your tax and your legal people, and it sounds like everybody's got slightly different considerations. What happens when everybody, and that includes the spouse, what, uh, and everybody's on a different page? How do you bring everybody together? I, I like the, the analogy uh, of an orchestra. Can you imagine one musician being out of tune? Absolutely. It, it feels horrible. So orchestrating the team players uh, to get the best result takes a lot of experience and finesse, especially when you're trying to get the balance right uh, between outcome and process. And it's important to understand the language of the professional advisors uh, and speak to the clients um, in a non-jargon way. I think that's probably key here. We want to help people uh, take the conceptual knowledge of the strategies and timelines and expectations and put it all together in clear and easy to understand language. Unfortunately, many financial aspects force consumers to confront head-on intimidating aspects of health, mortality, and their overall financial situation. Being prepared uh, uh, to avoid some truly scary situations. Between couples, it can be seen as an act of love. You can't create uh, your documents and then go away and say, well, I'm done. Because you need to go back and regularly assess and update things, especially after a major change in your financial situations. Couples don't share their financial uh, issues and perspectives easily. In my practice, I believe establishing open lines of communication to help couples better understand their money and their investment decisions goes a long ways to helping create a strong financial foundation. Oh, 100%. I just think opening lines of communication helps your relationship, whether it's with your spouse or your financial planner. But I know for a fact that a lot of couples don't share their financial information with one another. I personally, I have a couple of investments that I don't think my husband has a clue. So is there a story that you can share with us about any other experiences like this? Absolutely. You know, MK was uh, referred to us recently, and she's a lovely lady in her mid-50s, enjoying a full life. And then it happened. Uh, she lost her husband unexpectedly. MK told me later that she, d she wasn't sure. Uh, she recalls much of those first couple of weeks following her husband's death. She was there, but most of the next few weeks were obscured by shock and, and trauma. Mm -hmm. Her husband did everything. The investments, the taxes, the banking, the insurance, anything to do with the house, he did it all. Uh, MK didn't know where anything was held. Uh, she had great friends who took care of her for months, but there was only so much that they could contribute. In the meantime, her dining room table was filling up with uh, papers and bills, and that's when her friends referred her, heard her to us. In reflection, uh, MK said it didn't have to be like this. My husband and I were the poster couple for doing everything wrong. Some people feel they have it all covered uh, when they have a will or a trust, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. So we helped her put together uh, a, a list of things uh, uh, that she probably wanted to look at, and I think it surprised her a little bit. So we suggested finding things like a marriage certificate, the actual will, birth certificates for yourself and your spouse, current investment statements, pension statements other than Canada Pension or Old Age Security, the life insurance policy, the mortgage details, the house insurance. And here's one that gets overlooked often. For home computers and social media, log on information and passwords for online accounts, 
email, et cetera. Oh my gosh, this is such an imperative point here. Uh, I don't know my own passwords, let alone my husband's passwords to the account. Absolutely powerful stuff. Now for those people who are just focusing on their investments, I feel like they could be missing out on a lot. I have heard you say in the past, a will is not enough, and I'm getting a real sense now of why that is. I'd like to suggest that it's really important for couples to talk openly about their perspectives and goals. Reaching common ground often involves acceptance, patience, and, and a willingness to engage. Discussing investment strategy before uh, establishing goals and, and priorities, outlining the hows and whys, it, it seems counterintuitive to me. Imagine a situation where one partner's a saver and the other's a spender, each trying to have the other see the error of their ways. Uh, this can be highly emotional, and it's not an uncommon situation that I face. I could ignore, or I could choose to ignore, the 900-pound elephant sitting at the table, but I think advisors have a responsibility to help their clients navigate these tough conversations. For some couples, this has likely been a challenge for a number of years, I expect. You're able to offer real value by taking the time to have these conversations. Helping them remove these barriers is, is a really special quality. I know that money is one of the top drivers of divorce. What advice can you offer, seeing what you've seen in your practice? In my 150 plus files over the past 10 years as a certified divorce financial analyst, I've gotten a lot of referrals. And it's truly amazing how many of these files come to me and I hear over and over, Jim, my situation is so simple. It should only take a few minutes. That is, until we start talking about it. Many of the clients I've worked with over the years want to maintain the same standard of living they had as a couple, not quite yet accepting or recognizing that they're now two separate entities. It takes time to assess what your new income streams look like, what the monthly expenses are, and even where the income is going to come from. Understanding the new lay of the land, so to speak, often takes time, and for many couples going through divorce, the emotions are just below the surface. For many couples, a separation or divorce can also mean the loss of your partner, who is your sounding board for helping you make the decisions that you need or might want to make. Once they've made the decision to separate or divorce, the next important decision they might want to consider is what type of divorce do you want and choosing appropriate counsel. Mm -hmm, very true. There are a few different models to consider, but I don't think most people know much beyond the litigation choice, going to court and fighting it out. I understand the choice you make can have a great impact on the outcome of all the costs involved. The first thing I want to point out is that there are some files that are best left to the courts, cases uh, of abuse or highly contentious cases. I'm sometimes left to wonder if people might be a little hasty consider litigation, especially if the couple has resolved most of the issues or are likely to do so. These folks could be a great candidate for a collaborative uh, or mediated outcome. And when kids are involved, I want to ask the parents, what sort of le divorce legacy do you envision? Is it one of dialogue to solve matters or conflict and litigation? Remember, kids see all. What actually is collaborative divorce? Well, it's relatively new. Um, it's an alternative to adversarial divorce. It's a no-court option. You have specially trained family lawyers. You each have your own lawyer helping you sort out your needs. But instead of working against each of you, the lawyers meet with the two of you to create a settlement that's right for both of you. So why does somebody actually need a financial spe specialist on the collaborative divorce team? Agreeing on how to divide your share assets can be a major source of anxiety, confusion, and conflict. Uh, making smart uh, financial choices when you and your family have, can have long-range effects. When so much change is going on, do you want to be making those big financial decisions all on your own? For instance, if I want to keep the home or, or if I want to keep my own pension, what things should I look at? I've seen cases where one spouse keep the home uh, or keeps the home to, to raise the kids uh, with the effect that their long-term financial net worth declines and the former spouse's net worth goes up. Clearly, this wasn't an equitable division of assets. I think we could talk about this situation all day long. You not only help your clients look at the consequences of divorce, you can actually help give them a sense of what their new future will look like.
Thanks, Jim, for your input. You're listening to Boomer Life on CL 650. I'm Joanne Sutton. Today we are speaking with Jim Doyle, Senior Financial Consultant with Investors Group. If you'd like to get in touch with Jim or to find out a little bit more about him, you can go to his website, jimdoyle.ca, or call him in Vancouver, 604-682-5431, or toll-free, 1-800-665-7178. Financial security is a paramount goal for most Canadians. The need for advice has never been greater. Make 2015 the year you rediscover confidence in your financial future. Still a lot more to come in today's conversation with Jim Doyle, including thoughts on planning for longevity and the importance of financial literacy and having a written financial plan. That's next on Boomer Life on CL 650. Canada's only weekly radio show dedicated to the baby boomer lifestyle. This is Boomer Life on CL 650. 